All right, let's get started in Romans chapter 1. If you found that, why don't you stand and we'll read together God's Word. Romans chapter 1. Let's go ahead and read the sentence. Verses 1 down to verse 7. With the understanding, we're going to spend our time in verses 2, 3, and 4. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's begin at verse 1. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom... We have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be, saint, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you join me as we pray? <clears throat> Holy Spirit of God, we need you to speak from your word to us. There are Christian men and women here that need to be ministered to. Tempers that need to be calmed. Jealousies that need to be erased. Pains that need to be healed. In this congregation are many that would physically feel the uh, Results of the fall. And Holy Spirit, we need you to minister to us. Open eyes that we can see and ears that we can hear. Hearts that we might believe and love Jesus. It's in His name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> One of the hallmarks of what it means to be a Christian, and I think what it means to be an American, is to hold to the value of the freedom of religion. What that means is that we ought to be able to worship God as each man or woman sees fit without being harassed or, or persecuted or penalized. And although freedom of religion... Is a, is a primary thread of the fabric of our country and what it means to be American, there are signs that the fabric of that freedom is wearing thin. Especially for those of us that actually, if you actually believe what this book says, and more pointedly, if you genuinely believe what the 16 chapters called the book of Romans says. Because we're starting out in the introduction, and it's pretty tame so far. We're going slowly. We're sort of building a foundation. We'll pick up speed. But by the time we get to the end of the book of Romans, we run into some deep waters. That will be completely against the Zydeus of our day. That's why it's important, I think, for us right now in this time, in the part of our church, in the history of our church, to deal with the book of Romans. When you think about it, it is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. He had never been to Rome, never met this church. He did not plant this church. This church was planted in a pagan city. Rome. And the Roman Empire, you don't have to be a historian to know this, the Roman Empire would smile on spirituality. It was good to be spiritual. But Rome, at this time, hated Christians. Rome was a place where babies could be sacrificed and sexuality was fluid. A society that is oddly similar to our own. 
And in, into this confusing mass of, of sensuality and sin, Paul writes about, verse 1, he writes about something called the gospel of God. We're going to feel this. You probably already feel it. Some of you work in environments where you feel it every day. The gospel of God is, is so counterculture. In fact, in Rome, it was so counterculture, it was so revolutionary, that it would be another 300 years before Christianity was even legal. So, all of that to say, I think, that's why I think it is the right time for us to dive into the book of Romans so that we as a church, just as individual Christians and as Hickory Grove, so that we might be strengthened, we might be encouraged. I'm praying that the book of Romans will equip us for the tidal wave. It feels like that there is a tidal wave that is getting ready to crash on us. Even still, we don't look at the future with despair. We, we look with hope because of what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ and we believe that our God, through Jesus, will carry us through. Why? Because we don't cling to a social gospel. We don't cling to a prosperity gospel. We don't cling to a white or a black gospel. Verse 1 says we cling to what Paul calls the gospel of God. And in this section of Romans, verses 1 through 7... Paul explains to us what the gospel of God actually is. So verse 1, we, got, we ended up with the gospel of God. When you pick up in verse 2, it's actually an extension of that sentence as he explains what the gospel of God is and why we must cling to this gospel of God. So for the next half hour or so, my prayer is, I've been thinking about this all week and, and praying for for this time together, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will bring, those of you that are not Christians, will bring you to faith in Jesus so that you might trust and have something to stand on. And for the, the overwhelming majority of you that are believers, I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would move in such a way that you would be strengthened as you stand on the solid rock that is the gospel of God. So let's say it like this. The gospel of God is the only gospel that saves. Gospel of God is the only gospel that saves. Let me show you where I'm getting that. At the end of verse 1, you hear him talk about the gospel of God. And then verse 2, 3, and 4 are an explanation of that gospel. Let me press it even a little further. Verse 2 is going to be a display of why we believe the Bible points us to Jesus. Verse 2 is all about the Bible. And verse 3 and 4 go together. Verses 3 and 4 are about the humanity and the divinity, that Jesus is fully man and fully God. And it ends with an exclamation point. So let's just make it two points. One point is verse 2. Second point is going to be verses 3 and 4. Here's the first point. Number one, the gospel of God, let's say it like this. The gospel of God is always from the Bible. If you're a guest here with us today, this is what we do every Sunday. This is why I do the kind of preaching that I do. Tried my best to do expositional preaching, expository sermons. That is, we read the Bible and then we stand and teach the Bible. It's why sometimes that um, sometimes a, a, an expository sermon can be boring. There are no great stories in it. There's nothing that's going to jerk you around, make you cry or, or laugh a lot. We just read the Bible and teach it. That's why sometimes at Hickory Grove, the sermon can actually feel like a Bible study because the surest way for you to know that you are hearing from God is not some preacher's opinion or politics. The surest way is to point you back to the Bible. Notice what Paul is saying with me in verse 2. Notice what he says about the gospel of God. Verse 1 ends with him talking about the gospel of God, and verse 2 opens up. Let's just read the verse and talk about it. Verse 2. The gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. 
I point you to verse 2 to tell you that God, in fact, if I were writing something down, this is what I would write down. God keeps his promises. Do you see it in verse 2? It's he, the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand. This is God promising. God promised beforehand that the gospel would come. And he made that promise in the Bible. In fact, it is safe for you to say that the whole Bible, all of it, points us to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. There's a Baptist preacher, I'll go ahead and say it, Andy Stanley, may be misunderstood at one point, but he says we should unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. I think that is completely wrong. The Old Testament is there to point us to the goodness of Jesus in the gospel. In fact, we can't understand the Old Testament or the New Testament without reading the Old Testament. The Old Testament, Christ concealed. New Testament, Christ revealed. Old Testament, Mark Dever said, is a promise made. New Testament is a promise kept. And the Old Testament is what Paul is talking about right here. That the whole Bible, if it's precept or prophecy or promise, is pointing us to Jesus. In fact, you can reach back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, creation, and then the fall of man into sin. Genesis 3, God comes in the cool of the day to meet with man and woman. He finds them in sin, and the man points to the woman, woman points to the serpent, and God renders judgment. You remember what he said to the serpent? In Genesis 3, 15, it's the very first gospel, Genesis 3, 15, when he said to the serpent, the seed of the woman, there's one coming, who will crush Satan's head. There has been the promise of a hero savior from the very beginning of the Bible. Not only promise there in Genesis, but it's pictured in the Old Testament sacrificial system. If you're reading through the Bible, you start in Genesis going real fast. You felt good about January. Get through Exodus and then you fall over into Leviticus. Like, my goodness, about the time you quit the gym is when you quit reading Leviticus, right? <laughs> I think, why is Leviticus even here? All through Leviticus, you find uh, what is known as the Old Testament sacrificial system. The Old Testament sacrificial system is there to remind God's people that the wages of sin is death. That sin causes death. But God will accept a blood sacrifice as an acceptable substitute. And Leviticus points us to the sacrifice of Jesus. Reminding us that the Bible is centered on the cross of Christ. Pointing us to the cross of Jesus. Genesis chapter 22. Y'all know that story? We preached, took two years to get through Genesis. Genesis chapter 22. It's when God said to Abraham, Abraham, go and sacrifice your son Isaac. They went to Mount Moriah. Abraham and Isaac walked, built an altar. Isaac gets up on the altar. Abraham raises his hand with a knife in his hand. God speaks to Abraham. Don't, Abraham. There is a ram in the thicket. Sacrifice that lamb in the place of Isaac. Once again, reminding us that Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, would be a willing sacrifice for people that don't deserve it. Back to the text, verse 2. You'll notice that this gospel, the gospel of God, was promised beforehand. Keep looking at it. In the prophets. Verse 2, prophets. Who are the prophets? Well, you've got the major prophets, minor prophets. Major prophets are the ones that are longer. So Isaiah and Jeremiah, they're major because they're long. Minor prophets, like Malachi, they're shorter. So in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Daniel, even Moses is called a prophet. They are God's men. They belong to God, according to verse 2, His prophets. And God spoke through them to point us to the gospel and His, unchanged, His unchanging promise and plan, His gift to save sinners in Jesus. So the gospel is promised, verse 2. It is pictured in the sacrificial system. It's pointed to in the prophets, Isaiah 53. You know that passage? Isaiah 53, the suffering servant who was wounded for our transgressions. 
All of that to say that right here in this verse, verse 2, Paul is telling us that the new work of the gospel is the old plan of God. See if I can illustrate it from the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell the story of Jesus. They're the gospels. They talk about Jesus' life and His teaching, His miracle working. They talk about Him being crucified and dying on the cross. And as He died, the the temple curtain that separated the Holy of Holies was split from top to bottom, showing that now through Jesus we can get to the Holy of Holies, to God. We can get to God through Jesus. He died on the cross saying that it is finished and that work was completed, a completed work of salvation. Jesus dying on the cross. God raised Him from the dead. We're going to talk about the resurrection in a moment. After the resurrection and before He ascended into heaven, there was a time when He was on earth and appearing to the disciples. One such time is mentioned in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, after the crucifixion and resurrection, two of the disciples are walking out of Jerusalem and they're headed to a place called Emmaus, hence they're on the Emmaus Road. The Bible teaches in Luke 24 that Jesus went and walked beside them on the Emmaus road. And as he saddled up beside them, they were discussing the crucifixion, and they were having a hard time with it. They were struggling with the fact that Jesus died. They've heard rumors, people saying that now he's alive. And in Luke chapter 24, listen to what Luke tells us, verses 25, 26, and 27. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, that's the Old Testament, and the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them, those two guys, in all the scripture, the things concerning himself. You see this book in front of you? This is God's promise to His people. In fact, you see it there at the end of verse 2. Notice it at the end of verse 2, what the text says. He promised through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You see that little phrase, Holy Scriptures? You're not going to see that anywhere else in Paul's writings. So Paul wrote most of the New Testament. This is the only time he uses that phrase, Holy Scriptures. In fact, it really should be translated Holy Writings. It's an interesting phrase. This gives us Paul's view of the Bible. Now here, if you wanted to build a case for the, the divine inspiration of the Bible, why we think this is God's Word, this is a good place to go to, verse 2. But we're not doing that this morning. This is Paul telling us that the Bible is breathed by God. That God saw fit to have prophets speak truth and then write that truth down. Write down what God has revealed. And Paul is saying... He has shown us the gospel in the holy writings. So, holy writings, the Bible, from a holy God pointing us to a holy Savior so that you and I can live holy lives. Look, keep, I mean, just keep looking at it. Verse 2, you'll also notice the timing. Notice the timing of the gospel of God. See what the text says? The gospel of God, which He promised beforehand... Through his prophets. He promised it before. You see where the gospel was? That it wasn't God looking at our condition, thinking, what am I going to do with those sinners down there? I know I'll send Jesus and he'll save them. God's just so smart, he came up with that plan when he saw how we sinned. That is a backwards way of thinking about God. The text says that God planned it beforehand through his prophets. That is the the nature of a prophecy saying something is going to happen and then it actually happens. John MacArthur, one of the best known preachers in evangelical circles, and rightly so, pastors a church in California. Uh, this Sunday, in fact, he will have been there 50 years. 50 years. So on the day I was born, he had started his church. And he's still there. 50 years he's been preaching at that same church. Written a whole lot. Uh, some of his commentaries are the best that are out there to study, to find out what does God's Word say. 
And John MacArthur, when he looks at this passage and across the Old Testament, John MacArthur says there are at least 300, probably more, there are at least 300 prophecies about the coming of Jesus that were written several hundred years before. Now that ought to be amazing to you. To, to you Christians at least. I mean, I, I think sometimes I think Christians trust more in what Brad Panovich says about the weather. You listen to the, you believe the weatherman more than you believe the Bible. Let Brad Panovich say it's going to snow and you people lose your minds. <laughs> Rush on the gas station and the grocery stores. What does the Bible say? All of this to say a couple of things to you. Let me just tell you a couple of things that I think you can hold on to. This reminds us that God keeps His promises. The things in the Bible you find that are promises, God will keep them. He has promised the gospel and the gospel is given to us in Jesus. He keeps His promises. You'll, you'll notice something else about verse 2 is the timing is promised beforehand. That leads me to believe that God's timing is perfect. You may be questioning why you find yourself in the situation you find yourself in right now and you're waiting on the Lord to do something. I just want you to know this, this verse reminds us that God's timing is perfect. I'll give you a third thing to consider about the Bible. The Bible is not some place where you just sort of thumb through, put your finger on a verse and hope you'll get an answer. God might decide to do that. It is God's word and God and His Holy Spirit can do whatever He wants. But typically, you're, you're, you're not going to hear from God like that. God's Word, then, is going to point you to the Gospel. You see, the Gospel is not just you praying to receive Jesus, and that's the Gospel. The Gospel speaks to every part of who you are, all the time, every day. And the Bible is going to keep pointing you to the goodness of God found in Jesus, to the Gospel. You see, the story of the Bible... The story of the gospel, the gospel, the gospel of God is always from the Bible. That's, that's my first point. <clears throat> gospel of God, always from the Bible. Now let's, let's take our eyes. Okay, we got it. No, we're going to get the gospel from the Bible. That's what Paul says. Now let's see what he has to say about Jesus. Look down at verse 3 and 4. And in verse 3 and 4, you'll find out. Here's the second point. Number two, the gospel of God is always about Jesus. You'll see it right there in verse 3 and 4. The gospel of God, always about Jesus. In fact, verse 3 and 4, a lot of people, a lot of scholars that have studied this, they think that verses 3 and 4 actually, that that was a, an early Christian creed. That Paul knew, this is 35 years or so after the resurrection of Jesus, and a creed had developed, and he's inserted it right here in verses 3 and 4. Because what you have here is a description of the humanity of Jesus, verse 3, and the divinity of Jesus in verse 4. Donald Gray Barnhouse, I mentioned him, I think, last week. He's the one that took 11 years to preach through Romans. You guys should be more thankful. I'm just taking two years to get through it. 11 years on the radio. And uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse, he said that if you master verses 3 and 4, Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, if you master verses 3 and 4, then you will understand the Christ of the Bible. But if you don't, you are in danger of believing another gospel. Let's take the verses, let's pull them apart. Go with me to verse 3. You'll notice that the gospel of God Verse 3 says it's concerning His Son. The gospel is about Jesus concerning His Son. That Christ is the center of the gospel. That Christ is the means of salvation. That without Christ there is no Christianity. Any church that does not believe in the perfect life, the death of Jesus on the cross, His bodily resurrection, any church that doesn't preach that is not preaching a Christian gospel. It is not, it's another religion if you're not believing that. That the gospel is about Christ. It is concerning His Son. Keep looking at verse 3, you'll see it. What about His Son? Verse 3 says that He was descended from David. 
Twelve times in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, twelve times in the four Gospels, Jesus is called the Son of David. In fact, what's interesting, you could do this study yourself if you want to sometime. You can start in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, Jesus is called the Son of David. Take the New Testament, flip it, get to Revelation 22, the very end of the New Testament, and Jesus is called the Son of David. The Son of David. Why David? David was the ideal king in the Old Testament. It was understood, and in fact, God spoke and said, there will be a king coming in the line of David. He was the son of David in weakness. The son of David in weakness in verse 3. The son of God in power in verse 4. In fact, let's keep just talking about what does it mean, the son of David. You go and read the genealogies in Matthew and find them again over in Luke. And there you find out through his mother, Mary. Through Mary, he is the son of David by birth. But through Joseph, who is not his biological father, he is the son of David through adoption. Remember what blind Bartimaeus said? Know the story about blind Bartimaeus? When blind Bartimaeus wanted his sight, he knew Jesus was coming down the road. Blind Bartimaeus cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Mercy. Mercy is what he can give you. Mercy is what He can give you as the Son of David. Keep looking at verse 3. He was the Son of David according to the flesh. You see that? The flesh. Because He was the Son of David according to the flesh, He can give us mercy. Jesus, being all man, lived this fleshly life. He shared His life like all other men and women that have ever lived so that He might identify with me and you fallen sinful men and women and yet do it without sin. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is a great place to go to read about this. You can't understand the book of Hebrews if you don't believe that Leviticus is God's Word. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, you know what the author says about Jesus? Being our high priest, Hebrews 4, verse 15, he writes, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. Let me pause there. Sympathize. With your trouble, your hurt, your pain, the depression you're under, you have to take Hebrews 4, verse 15, and press it into your heart. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet he is without sin. Descended from David according to the flesh. He became a man who could die for all men. That's his humanity. Keep looking at it. Let's drop down to verse 4. Now, verse 4, let's take that entire verse all together. Verse 4 now elevates him. He was declared, I would circle that word, it might be declared or maybe it's appointed in your Bible. He was declared to be the Son of God in power. It's not that He became the Son of God then, He was already the eternal Son of God. But something happened to make Him declared to be the Son of God in power through the Spirit of holiness. That's the Holy Spirit. How was He declared the Son of God? What had to happen for that to go on? You'll find it at the end of that verse. Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. To understand that phrase, let's start with resurrection because that is the turning point. Resurrection. You see, the resurrection of Jesus, it is essential to Christianity. If you don't believe in the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, you can't be a Christian. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead changed everything about life. It changed everything about faith. It changed everything about religion. In fact, let's zoom in. Zoom in with me to verse 4. Let's get technical just for a moment. Everybody doesn't love it, want to do this, but I think it's important for you to see it. You see that word um, declared in verse 4, or yours might say appointed. Verse 4 says this. And he was appointed or was declared to be the Son of God in power. 
The resurrection wasn't when he started being the Son of God. He is the eternal Son of God. The resurrection is when it was revealed he was the Son of God. That word declared or appointed, it's actually a Greek word, horizo, uh, H-O-R-Z-I-O. It's where we get the word horizon. Horizon is basically a boundary between the sky and the earth. You look out toward the horizon. It's where the heavens stop and the earth begins. There's a boundary. Take that idea back into the text and put it back. And so the resurrection of Jesus, what Paul is saying here, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, clearly it's a boundary. It marked him out as the eternal son of God. Furthermore, keep pressing on it. The gospel cannot be understood and cannot be believed without the person of Jesus being raised from the dead as he ushers in a new era of redemption. Flip it over. Think of it like this. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus shows our victory over the penalty of sin. He shows our victory over the dread of dying and the pain of dying. Keep looking at verse 4. Notice what the text says. He is the Son of God in power. That's a great little phrase. Not just the Son of God, but let's, so you get it. He's the Son of God in power. He has the power to change, the power to heal. He has the power to convict the hardest hearts, to save the worst sinner. His love has no limits. His forgiveness has no end. His power, this is what we sing, His power has no equal. Jesus has the power, according to verse 4, to change sinners into saints. And He does that through His perfect life, dying on the cross, and His resurrection. You know, verse 4, it ends with an exclamation point. I'll show it to you. You, you need to look at it. It's a three-word statement and a three-word title about Jesus. You see it? It's worth looking at, and I'll close with, with this title. See the name Jesus? Jesus. It's an Old Testament name. It comes from the name Joshua. We're introduced to Joshua in Exodus after Moses is gone. Joshua leads God's people into the promised land. Jesus would be a new and greater perfect Joshua leading us into the promised land. The name Jesus, what does it mean? It means Yahweh saves. God saves. Mary was pregnant engaged to Joseph. Joseph was skeptical. Angel appears to Joseph and tells Joseph, you name that baby boy Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, he came to save you from your sins. Keep looking at the title of verse 4. Jesus Christ. Christ is the Greek word. Messiah is the Jewish idea, the more Hebraic word. Anointed one is what it means. You find it in the Old Testament, descended from David. The word Christ, that is Paul's favorite title for Jesus. In fact, Paul is probably responsible for the fact that we say Jesus Christ together so much. Why does he say Christ? Because Jesus is the uniquely perfect Son of God, the Savior who reigns eternally on the throne. Jesus Christ. There's another word down there. It's the word Lord. That word Lord is important. Especially for, for us, our tradition, if you come from a Baptist tradition, we come out of revivalistic leanings. Very evangelistic, as we should be. We should be sharing the gospel and praying that people are saved. Part of that sometimes drives us to put more weight on Jesus as Savior to the demise of thinking about Jesus as Lord. So that we sometimes fall over and present Jesus like some sort of fire insurance. Well, if you have Jesus as Savior for fire insurance, your policy no good unless you have Lord on it. The word Lord is important. It, that word there is reminding us that it is utter nonsense 
to think that you can claim Jesus as Savior and not love Him as Lord. In fact, if you'll look back closely, let's, let me just call your attention one more time to that phrase. If you look back closely to that closing statement in verse 4, there is a little plural possessive word. Jesus Christ, our, see that? Our Lord, personally. We do believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He is reigning eternally. But it, but it has to have a personal. In, in other words, it's not enough that Jesus is Lord. Even the demons believe that. Is He your Lord? Have you personally turned from your sin and by faith believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, that God raised Him from the dead for you, that He ascended into heaven to rule over you. Have you believed that? You see, the gospel of God, it is the only gospel that saves. It's always from the Bible. It's always centered on Jesus. And it is always declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. You join me as we pray together. With your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord in a time of commitment in prayer. For those of you here that are uncertain about what it means to give your life to Jesus and you'd like to talk to someone, part of our tradition at Hickory Grove is we hear a sermon and then we give an opportunity at the end of the sermon to sing and worship, but also for any person here that wants to respond physically and walk forward. You'll see pastors at the end of every aisle. I invite you to come forward. Maybe you want somebody just to pray with you. Possibly you're confused about what it means to be a believer. Now's a good time to talk that through. Our pastors would love to talk to you about what it means to give your life to Jesus. If God has spoken to you, when we sing, we'll invite you to come forward. Father, we do thank you for the love you've shown us in Jesus, for the clear gospel, the gospel of God. We thank you that you've given us your word that points us to your promise in the gospel. We thank you for Jesus who became flesh, descended from David, and is the Son of God in power. We confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take this truth and put it on the hearts of people today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Do you stand please as we sing together?